Welcome to the House of Hypertrophy. Is there an optimal range of motion to maximize muscle hypertrophy? We yet again have a brand new study on trained individuals exploring this question, and quite importantly, it assessed growth at two different muscle regions, enabling us to see if some regions might grow more with one range of motion or another. To ensure we're all on the same page and to familiarize new viewers, a full range of motion moves the joints in an exercise through their full potential. A length and partial moves through a part of the range of motion where the muscle is at a longer length. This is usually the first half of the lifting part of a movement. A shortened partial moves through a part of the range of motion where the muscle is at a shorter length. This is usually the final half of the lifting part of a movement. Let us assess the new paper and then understand how it fits into the rest of the scientific literature exploring range of motion for muscle hypertrophy. Let's dive in. Thirteen trained individuals with an average of approximately six years of experience were recruited. The subjects trained unilateral machine preacher curls twice per week for eight weeks. With one arm, subjects trained with a full range of motion, moving the elbow joint from 0 to 140 degrees of flexion. With their other arm, subjects trained with a length and partial, moving the elbow joint from 0 to 70 degrees of flexion. Both arms performed 5 sets of 10 to 15 reps to momentary failure, with 2 minutes of rest between sets. Loads were adjusted over time so subjects continued reaching failure in this rep range. Muscle thickness of the elbow flexors, which contained both the biceps and brachialis, was measured at 50% and 70% of this distance. It was found that growth at the 50% region was virtually similar between both ranges of motion, while growth at the 70% region tended to be greater for the length and partials. For those familiar with Bayesian statistics, the base factor quantifying evidence for greater growth from the length and partials at the distal region was 4.87, which is interpreted as providing moderate evidence for greater growth from the length and partials. So, we're not necessarily talking about a crystal clear and large effect, but, aligned with the authors, I am interpreting this as slightly greater hypertrophy at the 70% region from length and partials. Some may be wondering if the greater growth at the distal region could ultimately end up making your muscles look weird. I'm not convinced this is the case. You can find my full analysis of this in the pinned comment. Nevertheless, do these results mean length and partials are superior for overall growth? This is just one study with a small sample size, so alone it's not robust evidence. So let's briefly review the rest of the range of motion literature. For a while, it was thought that a full range of motion is superior for building muscle largely based on comparisons to short and partials. But in the last few years, studies comparing length and partials to a full range of motion have challenged this idea. This new study means there are a total of six studies comparing full range of motion to length and partials, with three studies on untrained individuals and the other three on trained individuals. All three studies on untrained individuals find overall more muscle hypertrophy with a lengthened partial. Interestingly, one of them by Pedrosa and colleagues examined growth across multiple regions, and it tended to show that for the vastus lateralis, there was a greater numerical difference between the full range of motion and lengthened partial at the distal region, supporting the idea lengthened partials might be quite good for the distal regions of a muscle. As for the three studies on trained individuals, we already know the findings of the new one, but the other two, including one with quite a large sample size, tend to find similar growth between a full range of motion and length and partial. Perhaps importantly, these two studies only examined growth around the mid-regions of a muscle, so we're left wondering how distal growth may have looked. Another way to describe this overall research is that length and partial seem to be at least as good as a full range of motion, with the possibility of length and partials building a bit more muscle in some cases. Of course, we're still not talking about hundreds or even tens of studies here, so you may still have some reservations about lengthened partials. Overall, the range of motion research has been developing quite nicely in the last few years, but there's still a lot to learn. For example, would the results of the new study be the same if they instead used a free weight preacher curl or another biceps exercise? And how effective might lengthened partials be with compound exercises that involve training a range of muscles? 
I think having a reserved viewpoint is perfectly fine, so it's absolutely justifiable for you to continue training with a full range of motion if that's your preference. Clearly, you'll still grow. But if you're someone who likes the idea of lengthened partials and wishes to experiment with them in some way, I say go for it and see how you get along. Of course, it's not an either or. You could include both in your training program and there's a ton of flexibility in how you could do this. Maybe you find lengthened partials more enjoyable on some exercises, but a full range of motion more enjoyable on other exercises. Maybe you perform lengthened partials on the final set of some exercises. Or maybe you have some sets where you alternate between a full range of motion and a lengthened partial. There are also certain exercises where once you reach failure with a full range of motion, you're able to squeeze out some extra reps with lengthened partials. We've explored the research on this way of implementing lengthened partials in a recent video. I thought it would be informative to have a quick discussion on shortened partials, as I want to make it clear that shortened partials aren't tragic. We have 10 total studies involving a comparison between shortened partials and a full range of motion or a lengthened partial. In general, Overall muscle growth is a bit worse with shortened partials, but it still produces growth and has sometimes been documented to produce similar growth around the mid-regions to lengthened partials or a full range of motion. For example, this paper compared shortened to lengthened partials on a dumbbell preacher curl. Growth of the biceps at the 70% region was greater for the lengthened partials, but growth at the 50% region was similar. Additionally, if we extend shortened partials a bit more, they might become a bit better. Let me explain what I mean. This paper compared squatting to 60 degrees to squatting with 120 degrees of knee flexion. Growth across multiple regions was greater with the 120 degrees. However, what if we extend the partial a bit by going down to 90 or 100 degrees of knee flexion? Well, this study compared squatting to 90 degrees versus 140 degrees of knee flexion and fascinatingly found similar quadriceps hypertrophy. A second paper compared leg pressing with 100 degrees of knee flexion to an average of 154 degrees of knee flexion and found both produced similar overall regional quad growth. So extending a typical shortened partial might make it a little better. That said, if we return to this particular study comparing 90 to 140 degree knee flexion squats, though quad growth was similar, they also measured glute max and adductor hypertrophy which was better with a 140 degrees. So, we don't want to make the mistake of thinking shortened partials do nothing, they can still deliver results. But given that most evidence suggests slightly worse overall hypertrophy, I would largely stick to training with a full range of motion or lengthened partial. If you're searching for further guidance on programming to obtain your goal physique, our high-quality partner, the Alpha Progression app, can generate personalized programs that are truly comprehensive and well-rounded. Input key details, such as what equipment you have, how often and how long you're able to train, and if you want to emphasize certain muscles. This generally takes less than a minute. The training philosophy is based on the latest scientific literature, and further customizations can easily be done, like changing any training variable or implementing things like supersets. During workouts, there's a built-in warm-up set calculator and rest interval timer. The app also provides progressive overload recommendations to assist you. Of course, the app can automatically log your progression across time. If you're unsure about exercise technique, there are straightforward video and text instructions on nearly 800 exercises. The reviews from tens of thousands is a testament to its exceptional quality, but we would love to know what you think. The link in the comments and description gives you a free two-week trial of all its features, plus 20% off a subscription if you decide to continue. Thank you for making it to the end. Feel free to check out another one of the videos at the House of Hypertrophy.